The following chapter is narrated from a book called The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Souls by Philip Doddridge. This book was used in the conversion of William Wilberforce. This particular chapter is called An Address to a Soul, so overwhelmed with the sense of the greatness of its sins that it dares not apply itself to Christ with any hope of salvation. In a previous chapter, I dealt with the unhappy creatures who despise the gospel and with those that neglect it. But with pleasure I now turn myself to those who will hear me with more regard. Among the various cases which now present themselves to my thoughts and demand my tender, affectionate, respectful care, there is none more worthy of compassion than that which I have mentioned in the title of this chapter, none which requires a more immediate attempt of relief. It is very possible some afflicted creature may be ready to cry out, it is enough. Aggravate my grief and my distress no more. The sentence you have been so awfully describing is what shall come upon and be executed on the impenitent. And unbelieving is my sentence, and the terrors of it are my terrors. For my iniquities have gone up into the heavens, and my transgressions have reached to the clouds. Revelation 18, verse 5. My case is quite singular. Surely there has never been so great a sinner as I. I have received so many mercy. I have enjoyed so many advantages. I have heard so many invitations of gospel grace. And yet my heart has been so hard, and my nature is so exceeding sinful. And the number and aggravating circumstances of my provocations have been such that I dare not hope. It is enough that God has supported me thus long. It is enough that after so many years of wickedness I am yet out of hell. Every day's reprieve is a mercy at which I am astonished. I lie down and wonder that death and damnation have not seized me in my walk the day past. I arise and wonder that my bed has not been my grave. I wonder that my soul is not separated from my flesh and surrounded with devils and damned spirits. I have indeed heard the message of salvation, but alas, it seems no message of salvation to me. There are happy souls that have hope, and their hope is indeed in Christ and the grace of God manifest in him. But they feel in their hearts an encouragement to apply to him, whereas I dare not do it. Christ and grace are things in which I fear I have no part. I must expect none. There are exceeding rich and precious promises in the word of God, but they are to me as a sealed book and are hid from me as to any personal use. I know Christ is able to save. I know he is willing to save some, but that he should be willing to save me, such a polluted, such a provoking creature, as God knows and his conscience knows I have been and to this day am, this I know not how to believe, and the utmost that I can do towards believing it is to acknowledge that it is not absolutely impossible, and that I do not lie down in complete despair, though, alas, I seem upon the borders of it, and expect every day and hour to fall into it. I should not perhaps have ventured so fully into this case, if I had not seen many in it, and I will add, listener, for your encouragement, if it be your case, several who are now in the number of the most established, cheerful, and useful Christians. I hope divine grace will add you to the rest of them. If out of these depths you are enabled to cry unto God, Psalm 130, verse 1, and though like Jonah you may seem to be cast out from his presence, yet still with Jonah you look towards his holy temple, Jonah 2, verse 4. Let it not be imagined that it is in any neglect of that blessed spirit, whose office it is to be the great comforter, that I now attempt to reason you out of this disconsolate frame, for it is as a great source or reason that he deals with rational creatures, and it is in the use of rational means and considerations that he may most justly be expected to operate. 
Give me permission, therefore, to address myself calmly to you and to ask you, what reason do you have for all these passionate complaints and accusations against yourself? What reason have you to suggest that your case is singular when so many have told you they have felt the same way? What reason do you have to conclude so hardly against yourself when the gospel speaks in such favorable terms? Or what reason to imagine that the gracious things it says are not intended for you? You know, indeed, more of the corruption of your own heart than you know of the hearts of others. And you make a thousand charitable excuses for their visible failings and infirmities, which you don't make for your own. And it may be some of those whom you admire as eminent saints when compared with you are on their part humbling themselves in the dust as unworthy to be numbered among the least of God's people, and wishing themselves like you, in whom they think they see much more good and much less of evil than in themselves. But to support the worst, what if you really were the vilest sinner that ever lived upon the face of the earth? What if your iniquities had gone up into the heavens every day, and your transgressions had reached unto the clouds? Revelation 18, verse 5 reached there with such horrid aggravations that earth and heaven should have had reason to detest you as a monster of impiety. Admitting all this, is anything too hard for the Lord? Genesis 18:14. Are any of your sins, are any sins of which a sinner can repent of, so deep a die that the blood of Christ cannot wash them away? No. Though it would be daring wickedness and monstrous folly for any to sin that grace may abound, Romans 6 verse 1, yet had you indeed raised your account beyond all that divine grace has ever yet pardoned, who should limit the Holy One of Israel, Psalm 78 41, or who shall pretend to say that it is impossible that God may, for your very wretchedness, choose you out from others to make you a monument of mercy and a trophy of Hitherto unparalleled grace. The Apostle Paul strongly intimates this to have been the case with regard to himself. And why may not you likewise, if indeed the chief of sinners, obtain mercy, that in you as a chief, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who shall hereafter believe? 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 and 16. Gloomy as your apprehensions are, I would ask you plainly, do you in your conscience think that Christ is not able to save you? What? Is he not able to save even to the uttermost them that come unto God by him? Hebrews 7 verse 25. Yes, he will say abundantly able to do it, but I dare not imagine that he will do it. And how do you know that he will not? He has helped the very greatest sinners or all that have yet applied themselves to him, and he has made you offers of grace and salvation in the most engaging and encouraging terms. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. John 7, verse 37. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely. Revelation 22, verse 17. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, And once more, him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6, verse 37. True, will you say none that are given him by the Father? Could I know I were of that number, I could then apply cheerfully to him. But dear listener, let me entreat you to look into the text itself and see whether that limitation is added there. Do you there read, None of them whom the Father has given me shall be cast out? The words are in a much more encouraging form. And why should you frustrate his wisdom and goodness by such an addition to, of your own? Add not to his words, lest he reprove you. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Take them as they stand, and drink in the consolation of them. Our Lord knew into what perplexity some serious minds might possibly be thrown by what he had before been saying. 
all that the Father has given me shall come unto me. And therefore, as it were on purpose to balance it, he adds those gracious words, Him that comes unto me I will in no wise, by no means, on no consideration whatsoever, cast out. If, therefore, you are already discouraged and terrified at the greatness of your sins, do not add to their weight and number that one greater and worse than all the rest, a distrust of the faithfulness and grace of the blessed Redeemer. Do not, so far as in you lies, oppose all the purposes of his love to you. O oh, distressed soul, whom do you dread? To whom do you tremble to approach? Is there anything so terrible in a crucified Redeemer, in a Lamb that was slain? If you carry your soul almost sinking under the burden of its guilt to lay it down at his feet, what do you offer him but the spoil which he bled and died to recover and possess? And did he purchase it so dearly that he might reject it with disdain? Go to him directly and fall down in his presence and plead that misery of yours, which you have now been pleading in a contrary view as an engagement to your own soul to make the application and is an argument with a compassionate Savior to receive you, go and be assured that where sin has abounded, their grace shall much more abound. Be assured that if one sinner can promise himself a more certain welcome than another, it is not he that is least guilty and miserable, but he that is most deeply humbled before God, under a sense of that misery and guilt and that lies lowest in the apprehension of it. Reflections on these encouragements, ending in an humble and earnest application of Christ for mercy. O oh, my soul, what do you say to thee, things? Is there not at least a possibility of help from Christ? And is there a possibility of help any other way? Is any other name given under heaven in which we can be saved? I know there is none. Acts 4.12 I must then say, like the lepers of Israel, Second Kings 7, 4, If I sit here, I perish. And if I make my application in vain, I can but die. But peradventure he may save my soul alive. I will therefore arise and go to him. Or rather, believing him here by his spiritual presence, sinful and miserable as I am, I will this moment fall down on my face before him and pour out my soul to him. Blessed Jesus, I present myself to you as a wretched creature, driven indeed by necessity to do it. For surely, were not that necessity urgent and absolute, I should not dare for very shame to appear in your holy and majestic presence. I am fully convinced that my sins and my follies have been inexcusably great, more than I can express, more than I can conceive. I feel a source of sin in my corrupt and degenerate nature, which pours out iniquity as a fountain sends out its water, and makes me a burden and a terror to myself. Such aggravations have attended my transgressions, that it looks like presumption so much as to ask pardon for them. And yet would it not be greater presumption to say that they exceed your mercy, and the efficacy of your blood, to say that you have power and grace enough to pardon and save only sinners of a lower order, while such as lie out of your reach? Preserve me from that blasphemous imagination. Preserve me from the unreasonable suspicion. Lord, you can do all things. Neither is there any thought of my heart withholden from you. You are indeed, as your word declares, able to save to the uttermost and therefore breaking through all the oppositions of shame and fear that would keep me from you. I come and lie down as in the dust before you. You know, O Lord, all my sins and all my follies. I cannot, and I hope may say I would not disguise them before you, or set myself to find out plausible excuses. Accuse me, Lord, as you please, and I will ingenuously plead guilty to all your accusations. I will own myself as a great sinner, as you call me. But I am still a sinner that comes to you for pardon. 
If I must die, yet shall be submitting and owning the justice of the fatal stroke. If I perish, it shall be laying hold, as it were, on the horns of the altar, laying myself down at your footstool, though I have been such a rebel against your throne. Many have received a full pardon there, have met with favor even beyond their hopes, and are all your compassions, O blessed Jesus, exhausted? And will you now begin to reject an humble creature who flies to you for life and pleads nothing but mercy and free grace? Have mercy upon me, O most gracious Redeemer. Have mercy upon me and let my life be precious in your sight, Second Kings one fourteen. O do not resolve to send me down to that state of final misery and despair from which it was your gracious purpose to deliver and save so many. Don't spurn me away, O Lord, from your presence, nor be offended when I presume to lay hold on your royal robe and say that I cannot and will not let you go till your suit is granted. O remember that my eternity is at stake. Remember, O Lord, that all my hopes of obtaining eternal happiness and avoiding everlasting helpless, hopeless destruction are anchored upon you. They hang upon your smile, or drop at your frown. Oh, have mercy upon me, for the sake of this immortal soul of mine, or if not for the sake of mine alone, for the sake of many others, who may on the one hand be encouraged by your mercy, or on the other may be greatly wounded and discouraged by my helpless despair. I beseech you, O oh Lord, for your own sake, and for the display of your Father's rich and sovereign grace, I beseech you by the blood that you shed on the cross. I beseech you by the covenant of grace and peace into which the Father entered with you for the salvation of believing and repenting sinners. Save me, save me, O Lord, who earnestly desires to repent and believe. I am indeed a sinner in whose final and everlasting destruction your justice might be greatly glorified. But, oh, if you will pardon me, it will be a monument raised to the honor of your grace and the efficacy of your blood in proportion to the degree in which the wretch to whom your mercy is extended was mean and miserable without it. Speak, Lord, by your blessed spirit and banish my fears. Look unto me with love and grace in your countenance and say to me as in the days of your flesh, as you have to many an humble supplicant, your sins are forgiven you. Go in peace.